Okay. Welcome to our interview series of our past presidents in celebration of the caucus uh, 50th anniversary in 2021. I'm the executive director for the caucus, Jessica Kolschman, and I will be interviewing our 1989 president, Cynthia Clark. From 2003 to 2011, I was uh, chair of the Com uh, International Statistics Institute Committee on Women in Statistics. And one of the things that we worked on really hard in that uh, in that job was to highlight the role of women and to uh, work on helping women make connections and to, uh, we had a lot of round tables that, at the meetings that would um, provide opportunities to uh, discuss uh, issues and to get mentors. Uh, and we had uh, a system of country representatives and the the committee, members of the committee would each have a continent, would be chosen one from each continent, and then they oversee the country representatives, and they try to get them to um, uh, get people who would go to different statistical meetings and also do the kind of things that the caucus does, and to uh, promote uh, interchange among women, women statisticians. So. That was um, kind of a big role <laughs> for a while. So that's really neat. We have we have the caucus now yeah. has a committee we on now, country. We established during my role term, we established a connection with the caucus so that the caucus, there was a caucus representative for one of the country representatives. Um, Amanda Goldbach was was it for quite a while. And I don't know who is doing it now. Amanda's still on the committee. Um, Sheely Lynn is our current caucus representative to the committee. So we did a number of things to highlight uh, women. Uh, we, we had just started a scholarship for, for young women uh, in statistics uh, two years before. We renamed it that year as the Gertrude Cox Scholarship uh, and we had a run a 5K and a 10K run at the meetings. We developed um, a program of uh, had technical, we had a technical um, session uh, on women. And we also had uh, a session that the um, Committee on Women and Statistics, which we co-sponsored with them. We also had uh, a very nice visible bulletin board uh, of, of photographs of women and items that women had contributed to statistics that that was visible and was uh, was there for others to see. So it was the first year that there were um, awardees for the um, Gertrude Cox Scholarship. It had been started two years before, but there had not been enough funds until that year. So that was, um, but. One of the other things that we built on is the need for uh, child care for women who uh, wanted to bring their children with them to the statistics meeting or it was the best way to take care of them uh, while they were at the meetings. Um, I remember that was a big issue and it was an issue. It was a time when women uh, in statistics were just become, beginning to become recognized. There were more women being hired uh, in, in statistics. There were not as many who were in leadership positions, but it was a time when people were moving, moving forward and uh, becoming more visible in terms of the field of statistics. That's very exciting. <clears throat> when you were caucus president, what was your favorite memory of the caucus? Probably the run. <laughs> I and actually did that. It, it's, I think they, it was often difficult to do it after that. Uh, the year I was uh, president of the meetings were in Washington, D.C., where I live. And uh, that was a, a plus and a minus uh, for going to meetings because you, the federal government didn't pay for you to be at the hotel. So you had to uh, commute to the hotel. But uh, Afterwards, uh, it was always hard to find someone who could do their physical arrangements for the 
for the run in the city that we were having of the meetings. I think it went on for about 15 years, but um, I'm not sure when it ended. Somebody told me the 20th was the last one, and it was 20 years of it. There were 20 years. Oh, well, that Marcia was said 20 years. She did the last one her presidential year. I'll tell you what, I have a t-shirt from all of the runs. From <laughs> all of them? I think I do. I could take photographs and I could send them to you if you would like them. I yeah, think we I, are missing some, I think. We have some, but not pictures of all of them. I think I have most of them. I mean, that would be awesome. One or two. Your pictures, that would be great. So um, if you want to tell me the ones you're missing, then I can look for those at another time or now. I will have to look in my book. Um, I have a book Mar Elizabeth Margosh has put together for the 30th. So I have some shirt pictures in there. So I'll have to look and see. Okay. And I can let you know. You're so awesome. Um, who do you remember most from the executive committee when you were president? Um, I think I remember most um, Jessica Utz, who was the president before I was. And one of the nice things about the caucus is I worked in federal statistics. So I got to know people who worked in federal statistics, but I didn't uh, initially meet as many people who were statisticians in other part, other, other in industry or in academia earlier in my career. Later in my career, I had lots more contact with academic acad academics through my um, work at the Census Bureau. <clears throat> but um, uh, I worked with Jessica a lot. The person who was uh, the um, president after me was never very much very effective. So I almost served two years as president. Uh, she really never, never um, responded or um, got things together. So Jessica and I and Cynthia, who was the one after Sue, uh, really picked up the slack between the between that um, over that that time period. So I remember uh, Stephanie Ship, who I'd met a couple years before, uh, Sandra McKenzie, who was um, a colleague of mine at the Census Bureau. I met Arlene Ash, we still are friends. Um, and Sandra Stinnett was uh, a big, a big con a contributor at that time, and Nancy Gordon. That's a lot of people. <laughs> <laughs> Did you think about um, how you could describe the caucus in two words, or more? Four words: um, uh, mentoring and mentoring and support. Mentoring support. I would completely agree with that. Is there, um, are there other things about the history of the caucus of the time you were president that you would like to share? No, but it was one of the first organizations um, of a colleague of mine. I don't believe she probably showed up in the membership, Holly Fuge uh, from Iowa State University. She was uh, gracious enough to share her office with me when I was commuting from my home in Des Moines uh, to, Iowa, to Ames, Iowa during my doctoral time. And she suggested that I join the caucus. And that was shortly after I got my PhD in 77. So it was probably my first group within ASA that uh, where I met people and it was, uh, it was um, nice to find some female colleagues. And my first professional job at the Census Bureau, there were, there were a few women, but not a lot. <laughs> We've come a long way, even though I think we still have quite a ways to go. Um, are you okay sharing some about your career path with us? Sure. Um, I'm probably very unusual in the statistics world because I had a family of six children. And, uh, and I was also uh, worked either worked or went to school most of the time when I had children. So uh, I did not meet many other women who were dealing with that many children over, a, and they were over 13 years. Well, 13 years from the time the youngest was born till the time the, the, time the oldest was born till the time the youngest was born. So uh, when I, so I was dealing with, um, for my first and from 
1977 when I got my PhD. So I'm 78. Uh, so I was born in 1942. I got my um, bachelor's degree in 63 in mathematics, my master's degree in 64 in mathematics from the University of Denver. And my bachelor's degree was from Mills College. And then I started, then I taught at the University of Denver for several years as an instructor in their mathematics department and realized uh, that I could teach the first three semesters of calculus, but that was all I would be able to teach. And I was bored. So I decided, well, I guess you have to get a PhD. So I started on getting a PhD at the University of Colorado. We, my, I was married at the time and I had two children and I started on a PhD. And uh, partway through that, uh, and it was part-time. So after about two years, my um, husband, who was, was a, a lawyer, got a job at Drake University Law School in Des Moines. He'd been teaching at the University of Denver. And, and I wasn't far enough along on my PhD to do anything other than transfer my credits. And I transferred them to the mathematics department at Iowa State. And it soon, it, this was 1970, and it soon became clear that there wasn't a future in mathematics, either teaching mathematics or doing, um, getting any kind of job in mathematics, which is interesting because I don't think that's the case now, but it was certainly the case in 1970, 71. So most of the people in the math department were looking elsewhere. And so I started looking elsewhere and uh, first looked at computer science and the uh, chair of that department was not very receptive to women and it was gonna make it really hard for me. And I was commuting. I had three children at the time and <laughs> I didn't think that was a good match. I went to the stat department. I don't even remember whether I had an appointment. <laughs> All I remember is I took my transcript with me and I showed it to Bancroft, who was the director of the uh, chair of the, the stat department. He said, oh, yes, you can come. And he said, you don't need any prerequisites. You have all the mathematics you need. They had a heavy um, math requirement for a PhD. And I've taken all those courses at the University of Colorado in uh, major theory and complex variables and all of that <laughs> that I've forgotten all about. Uh, and he said, um, You'll need one course in stat and I had um, taken probability and statistics as an undergraduate. And he said, you'll need just a course in, in statistical methods, at, which was their, a senior level course. And you can take it anytime. So I just switched from mathematics to statistics and uh, went on through a degree at Iowa State. And at the time, I did not know the reputation of Iowa State's um, uh, statistics department. Uh, in fact, uh, it was probably the one thing in my CV that got me every single job I got uh, from, uh, from then on. So then uh, when I finished my degree, I had five children and we, the youngest was six months and the oldest was 11, 11, yeah, almost 12. And uh, my husband got a job in Washington, D.C. And I had been thinking I was going to teach in a stat department, teach undergraduate statistics. I mean, that was really what my interest was, is teaching. And all of a sudden, that career was not really open. Uh, there are not a lot of academic positions in uh, the Washington, D.C. area because many there's so many adjunct professors that there are very few tenured, tenured faculty positions. So I was fortunate that I had um, H.T. David and Wayne Fuller or some of my professors and they gave me lots of, lots of leads for getting a job in Washington. Uh, so I followed them up, but I, at the time I did not see a way I could work full time. But I realized that I needed to get up at some kind of job in the workforce because uh, a statistics degree became old very quickly. So I finally got a job at the Census Bureau part-time working for an associate director in, 19, in the summer of 1977, which we moved in January. So, 
So then I moved around. I was at the Census Bureau for two years in a part-time position, went to an office called, that no longer exists, called the Office of Federal Statistical Policy and Standards because I wanted to work in time series. So I ended up doing um, more policy work than, um, than technical work. Then uh, that transferred to the Office of Management and Budget. And then I went back to the Census Bureau in the Ag Division. And then I went to the Department of Agriculture. Then I went back to the Census Bureau. Then I went to the UK. <laughs> then I went back to Agriculture. <laughs> wow. So I hopped around uh, each time, pretty much each time I got a promotion. So, so um, I had the opportunity, one of, one of my neat career uh, opportunities was to work in the UK. And I worked for the Office for National Statistics. Uh, I was a civil servant for the British. Very interesting for an American citizen to be a British civil servant. I was on a contract. I was basically doing the same job I had a, a, as my last job at the Census Bureau, which was associate director for, for methodology and standards and quality and research. So the titles moved around, but it was basically the same job except for uh, in the British system, I had fewer people that worked for me, but I had a larger scope of responsibility because their, their office at that time encompassed of things that were done by BLS, by Census Bureau, my BEA, and some of the things done by NCHS. So you had a lot of, other, you had a, a larger breadth of surveys. So I actually retired from the Census Bureau before I went to the UK. And then when I came back, I thought I'd retired and I was recruited to be head of the National Agriculture Statistics Service where I'd worked intermittently before. So. And then I retired <laughs> real? in 14. Well, I retired in 14. Then we went on a mission for our church. Uh, and then I came back and was on the board of the Council of Professional Associations on Federal Statistics and they needed an executive director. So I became their executive director for a year and a half. So I just retired from that this year. <laughs> Are you retired, <laughs> retired now? Yeah, I'm trying to figure it out. <laughs> Are you moving? What? Are y'all moving out of no, these? No, areas? we have a we have another house in Western Maryland, and we're doing a renovation there. So I really don't know what's going on the next month. So, so I thought running we back and forth there. all the time. Yeah. <clears throat> so um, yeah, that's probably more than you wanted to know. How did I become a statistician? It was kind of by chance, and I actually was so lucky. I mean, how can you be any place but at the uh, where statistics started in the U.S. <laughs> at least yeah, land cool. grant universities, yes. So, so and and it was actually um, there were an, it w was always an, a thing that came to attention when I was being interviewed for a job. That's very cool. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Um. Did we, did we talk about challenges you faced? Um, well, yeah, working with working part-time. Actually getting a part-time job was really difficult in 1977 with a PhD. And, and no one at the, um, I mean, the only one I, only way I finally, I, actually this is kind of a neat story. Um, one of the people that, um, that my uh, professors had recommended that I uh, interview or that I uh, contact was Monroe Serkin, who was at the National Center of Health Statistics for many years, a senior person. And um, I had, a, had, had, had an interview with him and there we had located in Washington bef you know, before I got a job and we were actually way across the beltway from where NCHS was located. Not, not, not a, a, a good commute, at least I didn't think so at the time. And he, we decided I wasn't really a good fit for him, but he said, well, can I send your resume to the Census Bureau? And I said, well, I'd been turned down by one of the, not the 
highest level associate director, but one of the division directors, I said, sure, go ahead. So then I got contacted by the two of the associate directors, the one over economic fields, Shirley Cowick, whose name you probably know from this history, and um, Hal Nisselson, who was over the, the, he was associate director. I actually eventually was in the job he was in. And uh, I learned from one of my Iowa State colleagues that they were both going to give me an offer. And I only got one offer. I got an offer from Hal because Shirley didn't think that someone could work part-time on time series when they had no one, but they couldn't have someone part-time. So, um, so I ended up working in disclosure, which has become such a big issue, even more big issue. So that was my first job working for Hal Nisselson, which wasn't actually a good fit because to have, to have someone who's at the very head of a big organization and uh, they usually don't have working people working for them. They're usually placed down in a division. So I got placed down in a division and I sort of reported to someone who had no supervisory skills at all. So therefore I lot left <laughs> a couple of years later. It's hard. So, so getting a part-time job was really difficult in the 70s. And I, even when I was associate director at the Census Bureau from 96 to 2004, um, I, had to per, I had to persuade my division chiefs. I had five division chiefs who reported to me. Each of them had over 100 people under them. I had to persuade them that an individuals could work part-time and could, produ could, could be effective. You know, to, to allow someone who was maybe full-time to go part-time or vice versa. I mean, sometimes I that's- even having men working for me part-time, <laughs> so. I mean, sometimes that's ideal for someone and that doesn't mean they can't do good work. Right, right. So that was a big issue and I think, um, I was really lucky with with childcare because I had um, had found uh, someone who was uh, excellent who let me bring my children to her home, which was great. <laughs> my home didn't get messed up. <laughs> yes, I came home to a clean home, and later I ended up teaching my children to cook over the phone, so they could prepare meals. <laughs> my children are very independent, <laughs> so that's a benefit. <laughs> For sure. Do you want to share anything about challenges that you think female statisticians face today? Um, I think they probably still face, well, right now, I think it's horrible for any working parent. Horrible. I don't know whether you're a parent or you, but if you have elementary or even junior high school children and you're having to work at home and the schools aren't there, I feel terrible for them because I don't know how I would have managed if I'd been in that kind of a situation. You know, it would have been overwhelming to me. So, um, so I think, I don't know. I, I think one of the things that's been important to me is to develop a network of people that I, that I've worked with or I know in all different areas. I mean, right now I'm working on a fellowship, uh, a nomination for someone to be a fellow and a nomination for someone to be recognized at one of the agencies I was, I was formerly with. And so I end up networking with people that I didn't work closely with, but I have their contact information and I had a good enough relationship that I'm not uncomfortable at all asking them for help or, or their opinion or advice. So. I have a, a large network of people that I know and many people that have supported me. So I think that's one of the things I find nice about the Caucus for Women in Statistics. Yeah, I can't say that I've had one person who's really been a mentor, although I will say I a while ago worked to establish a scholarship for a uh, graduate scholarship for, for in Wayne Fuller's honor at Iowa State. He wasn't my major professor. Uh, he wa I did take courses from him. I took his graduate courses. I don't even think he was on my committee, but he has mentored me 
throughout my career since I left Iowa State. Uh, but not closely. I mean, I'd see him twice a year. Um, or if I needed some advice, I'd call him up. Uh, but there have been um, there have been women. There have been a number of number of others who've mentored me. I wouldn't say it was ever a formal relationship. I mean, now they try to do it more formally, but it wasn't. And I, in fact, I established several programs of formal mentoring: one at the Census Bureau, one at uh, ONS, and one at NAS. <laughs> so, I think sometimes organic mentoring works. You know, just having someone who mentors you, but it's not an official relationship does work just fine yeah. for people. Yeah, I mean, and I, you know, I think of, oh, um, actually someone I met, um, Zahn, Doug Zahn, do you know him? He, he um, was a professor, I think, I think Florida State, but I may, it may be the University of Florida. And I met him once because uh, one of my uh, branch chief, one of one of my uh, leaders, um, wanted to bring him on as a consultant to work with uh, helping our employees be better at um, uh, consulting, statistical consulting. Uh, and and I became close to him and uh, he gave me some good advice at several points in my career, you know, because I just got to know him through that relationship, which was not very, not really very close. So, so I'd say uh, find mentors and uh, just uh, never burn any bridges. <laughs> <laughs> never burn any bridges. <laughs> That's how hard it is. <laughs> yes, I can understand that. Well, is there anything else that you would like to share before we wrap up? Um, I can't think of anything. <laughs> I really appreciate you taking time for us to meet. 